Hello everyone, my name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. Today we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare and we'll be covering our enemies. In this spiritual warfare presentation, we will introduce several spiritual enemies we struggle with in our daily lives. How we deal with each one of these affects us in one way or another, whether we believe it or not. As we move forward, please understand that our enemies work in concert with each other to keep us from living the abundant life that Yeshua wants us to have. Normally, when people think of spiritual warfare, the first enemy they think of is Satan, who is also known as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. This is mentioned in Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, 9. He's also known as Leviathan, which is in Isaiah 27, 1. The devil, which is throughout the Gospels. The thief in John 10. Beelzebul, also spelled Beelzebub, which is the dung god in Luke 11. The god of this world in 2 Corinthians. Belial in 2 Corinthians. And the dragon in Revelation. There is a taunt against the king of Babylon in Isaiah, which is understood to not only speak to him, but also to Satan. It begins in Isaiah 14.4. You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. As the taunt continues, there's another name. Isaiah 14.12-15 says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of Elohim. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Some versions translate Daystar as Lucifer. The Hebrew for that is Halel. The description of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, 12-19 is also understood to be talking about Satan because it refers to him being a cherub and being in the Garden of Eden. Since this was obviously before the king of Tyre lived, this passage essentially compares the king of Tyre with Satan. Ezekiel 28, 12-19 says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says Yehovah Elohim, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering, sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of Elohim. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of Elohim, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out of your midst. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. The noun Satan or Satan is from the verb Satan. The verb means to attack or figuratively to accuse. The noun is an opponent or adversary. When written as Hasatan, the adversary, this is the arch enemy of good. In Greek, Satanas is a borrowing from the Aramaic, a title for the devil or Diabolos, 
the principal supernatural evil being. Today, the Jews regard Satan as merely a metaphor for the Yetzer Hara, or evil inclination, but scripture indicates he is much more than that. There are some believers in Yeshua Messiah who are sitting under the teaching of non-believing Jews. This is a dangerous place to be because there are things we don't agree on, and Satan is one of those things. In the book of Job, Satan is referred to as Hasatan, with the definite article Ha. Hasatan means the adversary. He's not a man, but he is a spiritual being. We read about him in the book of Job, where he had a discussion with Yehovah in the heavenly court with the sons of Elohim, the heavenly council present. The first few chapters of the book of Job reveal Satan behaving as a lion looking to and fro for prey, as well as an accuser or a prosecuting attorney. He still functions this way in the courts of heaven today by pointing out our sins and trespasses to Yehovah. Fortunately, Yeshua is our defense attorney. In the book of Job, Satan came before Yehovah and Yehovah asked him if he had considered his servant Job. What eventually followed were false claims, devastating loss, and misery for Job. During this time, Job had no idea Satan was the reason for all his suffering, but in the end, Job was doubly blessed. Other verses in Scripture warn us about Satan. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Note that our adversary is identified as the devil, a traducer, one who exposes to shame or blame by means of falsehood and misrepresentation. When you see this sort of thing going on, Satan is likely behind it. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Whenever you see one or more of these three things in play, assume Satan is behind it. John 8.44 You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Messiah, who is the image of Elohim. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Yeshua Messiah as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Yeshua's sake. One of the primary ways Satan blinds people is through deception, and non believers are not his only victims. He can deceive believers of various things, too. When people are being deceived, they can't always perceive it because they are being deceived. 1 Chronicles 21.1 Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. In other words, Satan moved David to sin. We've all had that happen to us, I'm sure. However, we can't blame Satan for every sin we commit. Normally, when people think of spiritual warfare, they also think of Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. These spiritual beings, which are described in a hierarchy of highest to lowest in rank, are all demons. I think it is also important to point out that in Daniel 10.13, Daniel mentions a prince of the principality of Persia who is a territorial spirit. Gangs operate in a hierarchy similar to that of demons because demons control gangs. They claim territories and function in groups for various purposes, including stealing, killing, and destroying. The angels in Elohim's kingdom are structured in a hierarchy too. Michael being one of Elohim's chief princes. The body of Messiah also has a hierarchy. 
As part of that, we have different kinds of leaders in the assemblies and giftings from the Holy Spirit, and we're to use our gifts to be Elohim's ambassadors, feed his sheep, encourage the brokenhearted, and bring deliverance to those around us. In the Tanakh, there are two different Hebrew words for demon. Sa'ir, which is primarily what we're talking about with number two, a satyr, which may also refer to a demon-possessed goat like the swine of Gadara. In certain passages in the Tanakh, this word is used when referring to sacrifices to demons. Another word is shed. It's also translated as devil or demon. This is also seen in the Tanakh when it's referring to sacrifices to demons. In the apostolic scriptures of the New Testament, the word for demon is daimonion. It's related to daimon, which is a malignant demon used only in Matthew 8.32. Daimonion can refer to a heathen god, deity, a demon, or an evil spirit. These are essentially fallen angels. For those interested in how these words are used in the Tanakh, we will look at a few verses in Isaiah and see how they are translated into a modern English text and the English translation of the Greek Septuagint. Isaiah 34, 14, And wild animals shall meet with hyenas, the wild goat, Vesair, shall cry to his fellow. Indeed, there the night bird, Lilit, settles and finds for herself a resting place. In the Septuagint it says, And devils, or daimonia, shall meet with satyrs, and they shall cry one to another. There shall satyrs rest, having found for themselves a place of rest. You'll note that there are some differences between the English translation of the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Lilith is the name of a demon goddess known as a night demon that haunts the desolate places of Edom, and it can also be a nocturnal animal that inhabits desolate places. You'll also notice that this word is the same word used as a name for Mary in the TV series, The Chosen. Isaiah 13, 21 says, But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, and their wild goats, Usurim, will dance. In the Septuagint, it says, But wild beasts shall rest there, and the houses shall be filled with howling and monsters shall rest there, and devils, or daimonia, shall dance there. In Isaiah 13, 22, it says, Hyenas will cry in its towers, and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. In the Septuagint, it says, And satyrs shall dwell there, and hedgehogs shall make their nests in their houses. It will come soon, and will not tarry. So you can see that there are some differences between the translation of the Masoretic text and that of the Septuagint. In the Tanakh, demons were worshipped via sacrifices, and based on the definitions we saw, it seems that sometimes wild goats were thought to be possessed by demons. The Tanakh also mentions various kinds of spirits that are demonic in nature. Here are several. A spirit of jealousy, which is found in Numbers. Simply evil spirit, which is found in Judges. Harmful or tormenting spirit in 1 Samuel. Spirit of confusion in Isaiah. And spirit of uncleanness in Zechariah. In the apostolic scriptures, the Jews were struggling with demons who were dwelling within people. And they had their own methods of driving them out, as mentioned in Luke 11. 18 through 20. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of Elohim that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of Elohim has come upon you. Actually, delivering people from oppressive demons was one of the reasons Yeshua came to the earth. Luke 4, 18-19 says, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is a quote from Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. When Yeshua commanded a demonic spirit to come out of a man in a synagogue in Capernaum, the people were amazed at such a new idea. Mark 1.27 says, And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And what's very interesting here, I think, is the fact that this was cast out of a man who was in a synagogue. Oftentimes we think that people who are in churches or synagogues or assemblies don't have problems with demons, but they do. There are several examples in Scripture of the kinds of demons that Yeshua cast out. Here are several. An unclean spirit, mute spirit, oppressive spirit, spirit of epileptic seizures, and spirit of self-harm. In our time, deliverance workers have found that demons play a significant role in enforcing curses, being the root of numerous forms of mental illness, but not always, inflicting various kinds of medical conditions, but not always, behaviors such as inflicting self-harm of all kinds, including cutting and headbanging, etc., as well as suicidal ideation or attempts and actual suicide. The authority to cast out demons was given to Yeshua's disciples. In Mark 6, 7, it says, And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Mark 6, 13 says, And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Luke 10, 1 says, After this the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. In Luke 10, 17-20, we hear what happens when they came back. The seventy-two returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And we can see in these verses that serpents and scorpions are referring to demons. The same authority has been given to believers in Yeshua Messiah. Mark 16, 17-18 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Next, I'd like to talk about witchcraft. Those who practice witchcraft are another serious enemy to Yehovah's kingdom. However, not everyone is going to encounter this enemy. These enemies are all over the world, and you might not know one if you saw them. Some are quite handsome and beautiful, whereas others are quite ordinary in appearance, not like the image in the upper right-hand corner. Witches are all around you. They're in your neighborhoods, places of employment and in entertainment, hospitals, churches, law enforcement, and government. They greatly influence your world without your knowledge. For many generations, witches have been behind the scenes mounting intricate strategies against Elohim's people. The main reason I'm mentioning this enemy to you is because we must be alert to the powers of witchcraft coming against us in the last days as the empire of the beast tries to subdue, eliminate opposition, and control the world. People practice many different kinds of witchcraft. I'll mention two. Wiccans, who do not believe in Satan, practice what they call good or white magic, 
and they practice either solo or in covens. Those in Luciferian witchcraft do believe in Satan. They practice black or evil magic, and they can also practice their craft solo or in a coven. Whether they realize it or not, their power comes from Satan and his demons. Witchcraft has its sacrifices, satanic sabbaths or annual feasts, high priests, and brides of Satan. All this counterfeits what we see in the scriptures regarding the kingdom of Yehovah. Witches are in covenant with Satan like Elohim's people are in covenant with Elohim. They get their position, power, abilities, fame, and authority from Satan and his demons. They also may steal energy from others in their craft. They can be extremely dangerous and it's nothing for them to cast spells, curse people, kill animals, or capture, torture, and murder people. The Torah is very clear regarding those who practice witchcraft. Leviticus 20, 27 A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy 18, 10-14 says, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yehovah. And because of these abominations, Yehovah your Elohim is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before Yehovah your Elohim for these nations which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, Yehovah your Elohim has not allowed you to do this. There are a couple of instances involving witchcraft in Scripture. In Numbers 22, 7-12, the elders of Moab and Midian came to Baalam to pay him a diviner's fee so that he would curse Yehovah's people. However, Elohim told Baalam not to go or curse Yehovah's people because they're blessed, but Baalam disobeyed Yehovah. Proverbs 26, 2 says, Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless does not alight. Baalam from Pethor of Mesopotamia could not curse Yehovah's people because there was no reason for a curse to be upon them. But Baalam did give Balak away from Moab and Midian to bring destruction to Yehovah's people. They caused them to eat food sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. As a result of this, Baalam was killed with a sword in addition to the Midianite men in Numbers 31.8. At a much later point in time, 1 Samuel 28 tells us that King Saul had put all the mediums and necromancers out of the land. Despite doing so, he disguised himself and went to see one at Endor. While there, he asked her to call upon the prophet Samuel so he could seek advice from him. Saul's actions had serious consequences for him. 1 Chronicles 10, 13-14 So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with Yehovah in that he did not keep the command of Yehovah and he also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from Yehovah. Therefore, Yehovah put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Let this be a lesson for us to obey Yehovah's commandments on this issue. It is advisable but extremely difficult for witches to leave a coven or to renounce their covenants with Satan, but it can be done. First, they must overcome their fears before the chance to leave is gone forever. Other steps should probably be taken as well. Solo practitioners have an easier time doing so, while those leaving covens face constant persecution and sometimes even possible death. The world is our next enemy. Evil in the world exists in a wide variety of forms all around us, just think of our laws, education, culture, peer pressure, etc. For many, there's no such thing as a moral absolute anymore. 
People are encouraged to do whatever they want, whenever they want. People are told, you be you, when it comes to doing something that may be ungodly. Scripture has much to say about the world, so let's check out some verses. John 18.36, Yeshua answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Even Yeshua faced temptation from Satan, who used the things of this world, such as his appetite and power and authority over kingdoms, to get Yeshua's attention. Luke 4.13 And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Know this, other things of the world will repeatedly be used at opportune times to divert you from your allegiance to Yehovah. Matthew 13, 38-39 is the parable of the sower. In these verses it says, The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? James 4, 4 You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with Elohim? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of Elohim. 1 John 2, 15-17 do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of Elohim abides forever. Romans 12, 1-3 I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of Elohim, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Elohim, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of Elohim, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We renew our minds by reading and studying the word of Elohim. 1 John 5, 18-19 we know that everyone who has been born of Elohim does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of Elohim protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from Elohim, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Acts seventeen thirty through 31 The times of ignorance Elohim overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You, as sons of Elohim, are overcoming the world by your faith. 1 John 5, 4 For everyone who has been born of Elohim overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The final enemy is known as the flesh. This, not Satan, is your Yetzer Hara, mentioned earlier, the evil inclination and or desire that demands to be fulfilled. In Romans 7, 18-25, the Apostle Paul talks about the struggle he had with the desires of the flesh. This struggle is a result of two laws at work in us. We serve the law of Elohim with our minds, but the law of sin and death with the flesh. In Romans 8, 1-5, Paul explains that the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has made us free from the law of sin and death, so that the righteous requirement of the law 
might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the Spirit. Long ago, Moses set a choice before the people, life or death. Two laws or principles, such as the law that people would reap what they sow, would be at work as a result of their choice. Obedience to the terms of the covenant would lead to life and blessing. Disobedience or pursuing the desires of the flesh would lead to cursing and death. This is the law of sin and death. This is not what Yehovah desires for us. Romans thirteen fourteen says, But put on the Lord Yeshua Messiah, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Just remember 1 Corinthians ten thirteen, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Elohim is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of Elohim. Galatians 5.1 For freedom Messiah has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Romans 8.2-8 8, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Messiah Yeshua from the law of sin and death. For Elohim has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to Elohim, for it does not submit to Elohim's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please Elohim. To set our mind on the Spirit requires us to submit to Elohim's law, the result being life and peace. Romans 8.13 For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We need to understand, if we do not carefully guard our fleshly desires, properly and effectively manage our emotions, and forgive those who sin against us, we can create doorways, footholds, and strongholds through which our other enemies can enter and control our lives. Recall that I said most of these enemies work in concert with each other. Ephesians 2, 1-3 puts them in perspective. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. With this behind us, we must press ahead and learn to fight. 1 Timothy 6, 11-12 says, But as for you, O man of Elohim, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Before we ever dare to engage all our enemies in spiritual warfare, we need to learn and do a few more things that are coming up in future presentations. So be on the lookout for those. Again, my name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. Thank you so much for joining me today for Spiritual Warfare, Our Enemies. Until next time, shalom.